Um, thanks, Erin, and welcome everyone. Um, so today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Glenn Naira, who received his NSC degree in chemical engineering from the University of Cape Town and a Dr. Ram Naturalium degree in geology from the University of Westbeck in Germany. He has more than 13 years of experience in research, teaching, and industrial work in the field of economic geology, geometology, and machine learning. He has worked and collaborated with research and industry centers worldwide, such as South Africa, Canada, DRC, Germany, Ghana, Sweden, the US, the UK, and Zambia. Glenn is a recipient of the South African Rising Star Award in the mining and metal industry. In 2020, Glenn accepted the role of professor in the School of Geosciences at the University of the Witwatersrand. At the University of the Witwatersrand, Glenn teaches and supervises research on economic geology, geostatistics, geometallurgy, and machine learning. In addition, Glenn accepted the role of principal advisor at SmartMind, which is an entity that works with the VET enterprise to provide consulting and advisory services on machine learning and data analytics to the industry. Before I hand over to Glenn Nyler to delve through the VETS Basin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of two experts that have worked on the VETS Basin. That is Prof. Hartwig Freema from the University of Wiesenberg and Prof. Lawrence Robb from the University of Oxford. So Glenn, over to you. So today we are going to be speaking of a topic that has been well researched for a number of decades and we're going to be looking at some of the perspectives that have been discovered or that have been unraveled over time. And we're also going to be presenting some of the new evidence that have evolved over time. Most of them did not start with me, but I joined also the bandwagon and managed to find some useful information. And just to mention a few things, I spent about 10 years in different mines of the vet restaurant basin. So much of what I will show later on is based on personal accounts combined with literature that I have read uh, from other people. And the main aim for today is to speak of the erosion channels, which are some of the key distinctive features in the vet restaurant basin. Um, I would like to first show you some sort of very summary statistics for people who are not well initiated with the vet space in geology. I don't expect anyone to remember any names that I will mention, but it's key that you at least have an overall understanding of the geology itself. So without doubt, I must say that the vet restaurant basin represent one of the best preserved Archean sedimentary sequences. And, it, and it's also one of the most studied basins in the world. Um, compared to others. The other thing is we have been mining gold here in this basin for over 134 years. And with this, there have been many developments that the Vetvatesran Basin or the gold fields of the Vetvatesran Basin have come up with in, in the country itself compared to any other commodity that we mine. So at the moment, we hold between 80 and 90% of the global PGE resources. But gold itself alone has led to development of many cities, including the famous city of Johannesburg. But at the moment, our mining is taking place at very ultra deep conditions, greater than 4,000 uh, meters, which is about four kilometers below surface. And also the rock temperature is about 50 degrees Celsius and the vertical pressure in this type of mines that we currently have at the moment is about 100 MPA. And what you are looking at here on the left hand side is what people tend to call the golden arc in a way that we have a number of gold fields and each and every gold fields has a number of gold mines. So an average of between five to 12 mines in one particular gold field. And I'll show you a sketch later to illustrate this. And out of these gold fields, we have about nine of them and all of them have distinctive characteristics with differences in terms of uh, lithology and also in terms of structure. So to give you more detail on the VETS basin before we start with the main theme, we actually have two basins, as much as we tend to use the word VET restaurant basin, we're actually dealing with two different basins. The first one is the West Rand, and in the olden days it used to be called the lower VETS succession. And with these, we have a lot of different rock types and very really less of them contain much of the gold. 
And on the right hand side here, you can see we have a stratigraphy, which is known as the uh, central range. So this represents uh, the upper vets succession, which is the central rent basin. And it contains a lot of the gold that has been mined. So majority of the gold that have been mined in the vets basin comes from the central rent basin. And it accounts for plus or minus 85% of any gold that has been mined in this basin. The rest of it comes from upper lying stratigraphy, such as the Fentastop contact reef, which you can also see in here, and one of the youngest one, which is the Black Reef Formation. And to date, these gold fields that I have showed you in the previous slides have produced over 53,000 tons of gold. And at some point in the mid 1970s, South Africa used to account for almost 50% of the global gold production. But at the moment, we are only accounting for about 4% of the global gold output. We have been overtaken by many countries because of many challenges that we're facing in our gold fields. And much of this gold occur in distinctive rock types. The first one being this uh, quartz pebble conglomerates, and the second one being uh, carbonaceous uh, material that contains significant amount of gold. And I'll speak of all of them in detail. The question for many people with any form of a basin, it starts with understanding the geology to know what sort of tectonic setting are we located in and what sort of activities were happening at the time of deposition of the rocks. So what I want to show you in here is that, as I have mentioned, we have two different forms of basins. The first one is the Western basin where we have a lot of deposition of plastic sediments, mainly shales, as you can see in here. Some of them are iron formations, more on the deeper side of the basin itself. And then we also have a lot of quartz arenites, which have now been metamorphosed to uh, quartzites. And many people have argued with the types of basins. I'm not going to go into that debate for now, but we can discuss this further when we get to the discussions. But I would like to believe based on the available research and the evidence that we have by now that the Western basin typically represent something like a passive margin basin, whereas the central rent basin where we have more of our gold, where 85% of our gold is coming from, these typically represent what has now become known as a fallen basin. And of course, there is many evidence that have been gathered over the years that represent how do we explain the differences between the west trend and the central trend, and some of them I'll get into them as I proceed. Uh, I would like to show this slide, and the reason for bringing it forward is because it speaks to the modern day perspective of what resulted in the formation of such large gold deposits being, be, be, being the wet for this run. And over the years, many people have looked into this and with every discovery of a major deposit, people will also want to find something that is similar. So it means everyone also wanted to own a wet for this run type of a deposit elsewhere in the world. So many people have started doing research in many parts of the world. But in addition to this, there was a lot of geological and petrological details that were acquired by many people in different portions of, of the world. And what they have come across to notice was that the Vetvates Rand is not unique in terms of mineralization. Yes, it is completely unique in terms of endowment because we have one of the largest concentration of gold in a single uh, gold province. But when you look at the mineralization style, you will notice that it is the same thing that we see anywhere else, especially for material that was deposited between 3 billion years and about uh, 1.8 billion years ago. And the only distinction is that depending on the timing of deposition and the uh, prevailing paleo-environmental conditions, and also the hydrospheric conditions of the time, we have different forms of mineralogy. The first thing that people have noticed is that the style of mineralizations tend to be similar. The second one is that the paragenesis is more dependent on the availability of oxygen. And with this, you will notice that there are those that are far much older, such as the Bedfather's run that contains a lot of pyrite and uraninite and gold co-occurring together. Whereas if you go to those that were formed mainly after the global oxidation event, you'll find that the mineralogy differs slightly because instead of having pyrite, we have magnetite or hematite occurring with the gold. And the other thing that many people have noticed, and uh, I have also participated in writing about some of this, is that the hinterland 
is mainly an Archean paleoprotozoic granitoid greenstone terrains in all cases, regardless of where you are. So lastly, this is this tend to show us that the vertebrates strand is not really unique. So whatever I'll be speaking about here is not something that is only unique to our continent or our, our, our Creton, but it's also found elsewhere. And for those who have not been following up much on the statistics, you will also notice that uh, the so-called vertebrates run type gold deposits account for 30% of the global endowment of gold deposits. So at the moment, statistics shows that we only know between 280 and 311,000 tons of gold that is known to occur in ore deposits. 30% of that occurs in the vertebrates run type gold deposits. And out of these, almost 30% of any known gold that has ever been mined on Earth also comes from the vet space and not just the type of the gold deposits. And the rest of it is fairly distributed within other clans, such as the greenstone clan, epithermal clan, among, among other type of gold deposits. But now we need to look at this systematically because over time, people have come up with genetic models to explain the formation of gold in the vertebrates run basin. And to do this, I think I would like to go back first to the basics of what is a mineral deposit. And a mineral deposit has become known as a systematically arranged information for describing essential information or properties of the ore, which actually help us to be able to assign different deposits into different classes. But what I have also come to notice is that in most cases, we'll only know the true nature of a deposit after mining has reached maturity. And this actually tells us that there is no better time than now for us to know exactly what resulted in the largest concentration of gold in the red water sun basin. And therefore, a genetic model can now be interpreted by synthesizing all the information that is available, looking at the physical evidence, looking at the petrogenic evidence and geochemical evidence, and combining that, I think this can help us to know exactly the true nature of the red water sun basin. And to do that, uh, we first need to look at the knowledge evolution, what happened in the past and what is exactly happening now and what is our current understanding. So in the early days of the discovery, of course, the deposit was discovered in the 1800s, but in the early 1900s, many people started looking into this. Uh, a model was put forward to explain this, to say that much of the gold was concentrated by placer-related uh, processes. But over time, things changed. In the 1930s, many people started coming with all sorts of models and a magmatic base model was invoked to explain the wet waters run gold deposits. And later on, for far much more recent, I'll say in, 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 the 19, in the late 80s, 1987, for an example, a paper was published that actually stated that much of the gold that we have can be explained by syn depositional pyretic X highlights. But the problem with this model, it cannot explain for the variation of the staking of the different ore bodies that we have in the vets. And such type of deposits were not found anywhere else. So such a model remains speculative for many years and, 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 and it just lost its standing over time. And in the 1990s, and even prior to that, there was also a lot of work that was done and I'm very grateful to see that some of the people who have worked in the vets for far much longer than me uh, uh, have also joined us today. There was a model that was proposed for hydrothermal altered granite, which was actually explaining much of the features that we typically see in the vets basin. But the only challenge with some of, uh, uh, of this model was the mere fact that the amount of gold that we have in the vets basin cannot simply be accounted for by a particular section of the basement rocks. So it means more is needed to actually account for that. In the 1990s, many people will, will know that meteorite impacts are also known to come with many forms of, uh, of deposits, including gold and PGEs in some places. So a meteorite impact related model was also invoked, but that did not gain a lot of standing. And uh, a continued research, which actually is one of the most standing research, remain on whether this can be explained by hydrothermal models. As you can see on the right hand side, thin section and uh, Hartwig Trimmel have presented a, uh, this slide for, for many years, also uh, showing similar things. 
And the other thing that you'll also notice on the right-hand side, there was also a modified placer model that was refined over time to explain much of the goal that we see in the vets. And the main debate actually has remained to say that do we have much of the gold that was introduced after the deposition of the sediments and what sort of processes have actually took place in here. The other one was mainly explaining to say that there has to be some sort of uh, an explanation that can be based on the nature of the host rocks itself themselves based on the mineralogy, because we see this mineralogy that is cons it consists of minerals that are typically found in sedimentary type of setting. And also in addition to that is the ore grade itself, which I will dwell into later on. So on the left-hand side, much of the hydrothermal models also evolved to look into things such as metamorphic uh, CO2 devolatization fluids as some of the possible ways in which gold may have came into the system, sourcing much of this gold either from greenstone related gold deposits. But the main challenge with sourcing much of the gold from greenstone sources is that the peak in the global orogenic gold deposits is only about 2.7 billion years ago. And by then the Vetvates Rand was already existing in one form or the other because much of it was formed around 2.9 billion years ago. So the hydrothermal models did not see much of the light of the day, but still there was still a question of where does all this gold comes, comes from. And this actually brings us to what has been happening, which will lead into the erosion channel. So before 2005, I only used the 2005 as a cut line um, uh, to show that a lot of uh, a lot of information came up, but many years before that, there have been a lot of data where people started looking at potential sources. And what has happened over the years, it was found that we don't need a particular point where we can see this is where we found the vets basin type of gold deposits, because over the years, evidence has shown that. There is a lot of background concentration of gold that can be found in the Vetvates Run Basin, uh, that can be found in, in, in the basement granite greenstone terrains to make that correction. And with this, it means the only thing that we need, we need a way to actually scavenge some of this gold from the background sources, such as the granite greenstone terrains. But in addition to this, we also need an interplay between good climatic conditions, hydrospheric processes, and good fluvial type of processes. So the best model that now have been adopted by many people, I'm not saying that there are no arguments on it and so forth, is the fact that we do understand now based on the available evidence that much of the gold was mobilized from the background concentration in the hinterland by the processes that were operating at the time. And I'll explain this more in detail in the next few slides. So what you are looking at here is actually a diagrammatic representation of what things look like at the moment in the vet spacing. So what you are looking at is a multiple stacking of auriferous conglomerates that you can see in here. And on top of that, we have other forms that do not belong to the vets, vet fetus runs graphy, such as the Fentestop and the Black Reef. So to summarize this model, so the current understanding is that back in the days in the, in, in the Mesoarchean times, we actually had very good conditional setup where we had intensity of volcanic activity. So a lot of CO2 degassing into the atmosphere. But in addition to that, if you have such harsh conditions, it means also the pH of your rain is going to be far more slightly lower. So at a pH of around four, almost the pH of vinegar. And on top of that, it means you'll also have a lot of silicate weathering. And we have found this not only in the conglomerates, but we have also found this in shales to give you an example. And in addition to this, it means it at these particular conditions, we also have high solubility of gold because once this meteoric water reaches the ground where we have these uh, rocks or the basement rocks, we can start now leaching out or dissolving much of the gold. And with the dissolution of the gold, the only thing that we're going to need is a mode for, for transporting the gold and a mode to precipitate the gold. And by looking at the rocks themselves, it is quite clear that we did have a lot of fluvial activity and in some portions quite harsh because there was no trees or anything to actually stop the movement of water or to limit anything like that. So there are no much debates on the fact that there were a lot of ancient river system in the Vetvates run, 
the only thing that maybe many people also still uh, speak about is the fact that what sort of activities were happening to be able to source the gold or to absorb the gold and precipitate it from this large volume of water that was flowing. So that's one of the things that we, we will just touch base on and it has been covered in many research. I took this slide from Hartwig for a reason because it links quite well with the carbon leader erosion channels in this sense that the main source for precipitating much of the gold in this Asian river system, we needed a form, either in a form of reduction where we can precipitate gold or in a form of oxidation. And if you have seen in that diagrammatic indication, what I have shown in there is some of the early life forms which may have produced the first whiffs of oxygen in the atmosphere. And all you need there is just more of a slight elevation of oxygen in, 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 when, when the water comes in contact with this old microbial life that may have existed at the time. And with this, we can have oxidative precipitation of gold into kerogen or some sort of a life form that was existing at the time. And how do we know about this? One thing that we know, which I will also show you in a figure, is that much of the gold that we see, especially the high grade gold concentration in the basin, we tend to find it where we have organic material. And much of this well-preserved organic material is sitting very close to the lower part of the central rand group, which contains majority of the gold. And the gold is found with many other sources. It's found with pyrite. It's also found with uraninite, the trital uraninite. But in addition to this, it's more of the structural, uh, the nature of the structures of this carbonaceous material. You can see that much of them still preserve a primary relic that shows that they have not been formed by migration of hydrocarbons of any other form. And how do we know about this? Much of the work has been done in the past and much of this work firstly focus on the petrography to look at how do things look like when we go into the field. And people have found these delicate sedimentary structures that you see on, on, on the top right hand, uh, left hand side. And what you can see there is a very nice, well-preserved, caustic type of material that we find, and that contains a lot of kerogen. And more of a groundbreaking study did not happen after 2005, as I have mentioned that many people have been working on this. Around 2001, a paper was published that was looking at the carbon isotopes, but not only just the carbon isotopes, those who follow organic chemistry, you'll also understand that they also look at the number of N alkanes, which actually tend to assist us in a number of things. And I'll mention those just to give, to get everyone into speed. So this particular study that you're looking at here, they looked at particular carbon bearing material and they have looked at carbon 13 and also a number of the different carbon chains. And with this, they have also looked at the number of N alkanes. And when we look at the carbon 13, if we're looking at Carbon, carbonaceous material that was formed by migrating hydrothermal, uh, uh, migrating uh, hydro, hydrocarbons, we were going to see more of high fractionation or high changes with uh, carbon 13 that has been measured. So what was done here was to take the Vertvater strand uh, stratiform carbon seam, they were subjected to the same kind of measurements for measuring the carbon-13 isotopes and the number of N alkanes. And what was found was that when you look at the VETS type carbon, it's more of consistent, meaning it does not get fractionation, fractionated with increase in the number of chains in the N alkanes. Whereas when you look at more of pyrobutamine, which we find in the upper stratigraphy of the Transvaal supergroup, which overlies the Vetwaterstrand Basin after this uh, uh, fended stop supergroup, we find that the carbon that we find in reefs such as the Black Reef, among others, is highly fractionated. And there's also a significant change with the increase in the number of N alkanes. And this actually shows that the carbon that we find in this carbonaceous seams are more of indigenous to the wet vertex run, to the wet vertex run, and are not coming from other, other, other sources such as the Transvaal supergroup coming from above or any other sources. So, as I have mentioned, that much of the gold that we find in the vets basin tend to have a very good link with the older basement uh, ore bodies, which are known as reefs, 
that are containing co uh, carbon. And what you are looking at here is actually a change in grade of the gold in grams per ton over time and the amount of tonnages that were produced from these gold deposits. And what you are looking at at the y-axis on the left-hand side, you are looking at the age. So we're starting with the oldest age and where else on the right uh, axis. Uh, uh, and the, on the x-axis, we are looking at the gold grade in grams per ton. And what you will notice is that the all bodies that were formed around 2.9 billion years ago contains the highest amount of gold as compared to the gold deposits that were formed later on around 2.0 billion years ago or around uh, 2.7 billion years ago in the case of the VCR or 2.64 billion years ago in the case of the Black Reef or elsewhere in the world, such as in Brazil and Canada and, and Ghana, for an example. So this tends to show you that there was actually a lot of erosion happening over time on these deposits and much of this erosion is quite preserved in a number of places. And this is the core of what I want to speak about because what I'm going to be showing you here is just few slides while we, 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 head, we head towards more of a unified model. It's a few slides that is showing you a schematic formation of the carbon leader reef which is one of these reefs that were formed around 2.9 billion years ago. And it forms part of the lower part of the central rent group. And this is the reef that you are looking at here in red. But in the middle of this reef, there is a unique structure here, which is known as the erosion channel. And what you are looking at as numbers here is the number of mines in one particular gold field. So this is the Carltonville gold field. You can see it has over 13 mines in one gold deposit. And how these reefs occur is you have the carbon leader here sitting at the bottom, you have the midly flay reef above it, and then we have the VCR, which is the fantastic of contact reef, and above it we have the black reef sitting far up, uh, far up just here. But in the middle here we have this major erosion channel. These erosion channels are quite common in the vet basin, so they are not only unique to the Carltonville gold field. And the only reason for using the Carltonville gold field is that it's more accessible because mining is still active and it's quite well preserved because for many years it was avoided in terms of mining. And it's only now that attempts to mine it have been made. So if you look at the mineralogy of the carbon leather and you also look at the gold distribution, you will notice that the current gold concentration in the carbon leader is quite highly variable. And what we tend to see here is that we have gold grade that even goes to over 50 grams per ton. While they were still mining the carbon seams, we could even mine gold at over 500 grams per ton in certain portions of the mine. And what we also tend to see is that the mineralogy of it is quite consistent with, with, with the mineralogy that we also find in younger reefs, for an example, we have a lot of gold, much of it will appear secondary because of a lot of remobilization that have occurred and mechanical recycling to form far much of the newer reefs. And then the other thing that you'll also notice is that we have a lot of other minerals such as chat, we have a lot of quartz pebbles, and we also have a lot of pyrite of different forms. So we mainly have three main forms just to simplify it, but of course there's more than that. So the first one is typically uh, the trital type of pyrite, you can see this semi-rounded type of a grain here on this thin section that we're looking at here. Then we also have this larger diagenetic pyrites. Sometimes they also contain inclusions, so they are more syngenetic. Then we have a lot of euhedral pyrite, which have been used by many people to defend the hydrothermal model. So looking at the mineralogy of the carbon leader and the distribution of gold and the location of this precious carbon seams in the erosion channel, we can look at the fastest model. So this is more on a four kilometer scale. So you can see this is far much larger coming from one particular gold field. And what we have here, we have these erosion channels. We have one in here, which is sitting on the Driftfontein site. And then we have another one here sitting in an area known as Blyfo. Then we also have these, which, which are called kerogen seams. So these kerogen seams, which are in gray in color, these are the ones that were more richer in gold. And then we also have the payload current direction measurements that many people have, have measured, including myself. 
which are indicated by some of the markers here. So the main focus for today, I'll just stick to here. Of course, we have studied all of them. And what we simply did was to drill as many boreholes as we can. And for the purpose of this, I will illustrate three. This is a section of it now looking at the vertical cross section. You can see in here, we have the undisturbed lower vet stratigraphy coming from this uh, Western group. And then above it, we actually have the first contact of the central rand group, which is, which is mainly the quartzite, uh, the quartzite formations that we find here at the bottom. And just above it now, we are going to have our first reef contact, which is going to be our carbon leader. And in our carbon leader, it has been cut by this thick channel that goes about 100 meters uh, uh, down, and it extends for over 2,500 meters the width of it. So we have characterized this in detail, looked at into, into its facets, look into the form of rock types. And what we have noticed was that much of the rocks that we find inside these channels are similar to the overlying rocks, be it some of those that are coming from the carbon leader itself. And we also find them that are coming from the surrounding stratigraphy, showing that there was a lot of erosion and redeposition into the channel itself. And if now we were to look at erosion on a bigger scale and try to link it back into that, you will notice that there is a well-documented history of erosion in the Red Vatestrand Basin. And some of these erosion events have been given all forms of names. My main uh, argument here is not going to be on, on the main sources of names, but it's just to show you the sequence of events for some of these. So you can see, as old as about 2.9 billion years ago, we had records that shows that there's a lot of unconformities that are existing in the Western group itself. And they've been mapped ex extensively across the different gold fields, wherever there is access and also on surface. But the other one that we have noticed was the fact that the central rent group, which contains a lot of gold was deposited in a lot of these unconformable surfaces that are representative of erosion on a basin scale, not just on a localized scale. The other one that you will also notice is that we have a lot of structures, some of them induced by later deposition of continental flood basalts. But in addition to that, we also have a lot of younger structures that are related to other type of magmatic activities, such as the Bushfeld Igneous Complex magmatic event. It also came with its own structures and some of them we can still find them in the Vetvatestrand Basin. So if we look at the mineralogy of this erosion channel, to show you that this is similar exactly to what we have seen on the carbon leader and what we have seen in the surrounding rocks, you will also notice here that it has a lot of chat, as we have seen, it also have a lot of quads in the matrix itself. Then we also have a lot of the so-called flow bending, that we tend to find in, in, in some of these rocks. And a unique characteristic is this, uh, is this type of occurrence, which is called chloritoid. So chloritoid is one of the things that is more typical uh, within this erosion channel, but the chloritoid is also found above the carbon leader reef to show that it was actually sourced quite locally within the local stratigraphy. And if we look at the gold distribution in the erosion channel, you can see that we are only speaking of things that goes to one gram per ton. Of course, there are unique occurrences of nuggets that goes up to 80 grams per ton, but that is quite highly localized. Much of it actually is fairly distributed between 0 0.5 to about one gram per ton. And much of the host rocks that actually contain this gold, we tend to find it only more on the coarser sediments, which are mainly the conglomerates or quartz pebble or, 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 or quartz that is more of coarser grain. And in the shale, it's a shale themselves that we find inside this channel, we tend not to find a lot of gold. What we have done was to reinterpret some of the old seismic sections. And this was to also look on the bigger scale to say, what is the effect of this erosion channel? And what we have found, we found that these large depression structures very close to these erosion channels that go far below the Western stratigraphy. So if we're looking in here, you can notice that the carbon leader represent more of the bottom portion of the central rain group, whereas the rhodopod formation represent the upper younger succession of the, vet, of the Western group. And where the erosion channel occur, there is a lot of depression structures and a lot of material that are showing that they have been moved as sediments or large boulders coming from the surrounding stratigraphy. 
Uh, many people have argued and accused most of the people who have worked in the vets basin, especially those who speaks of syn genetic, syn genetical deposition of gold to say we are ignoring structural geology. As part of my work, I do a lot of modeling. And what I simply did was to take structures from different gold fields, remodel them to see whether some of this gold may be coming from these structures or whether we can find some of this gold in, in, in the structures or any evidence of transportation of gold from these major structures. But um, what I have found is that all these major structures have different architecture depending on the gold field where you are. Secondly, none of these structures actually contain any gold or any sign of gold. Thirdly, is that any mobilization that is due to structures is mainly localized within the all body horizon. So the green part is going to be the carbon leader or all body horizon. And the pink part, uh, the, the, purple, the purple part that you see here is mainly representing the Black Reef, which is also far much younger. And if you look further to the north, you can see that the Black Reef subcrop against the carbon leader. And what we tend to see is that much of the gold remobilization only occur within the reef horizon. None of the gold is bound or controlled by the structures. So all these major structures, be it the falls and the dikes, do not contain any gold and do not show any sign of gold hosting or transportation except localization. And this tells us something that much of the gold that we find mainly maybe in the Black Reef and any other reef that is younger than the carbon leader is a typical indicator that much of the gold was recycled coming from the older succession. And again, to show that we don't ignore structure, if you look at this typical map that you're looking for, uh, that you're looking at the right hand side, you will notice that there's a lot of major structures and a lot of thrust based structures which are known to contain some, some of the gold in orogenic gold deposits, especially the low angle dipping ones. But in the vets basin, be it the syn genetic uh, structures and the post depositional structures, none of them seems to have any effect on gold mobility more on, or, on, on a regional scale, but the only thing that we tend to see is more of a lot of remobilization within the reef horizon. And the other thing that you can look at is on the right-hand side, which the erosion channel have showed, and the carbon leader shows exactly the same thing, that much of the gold that we mine is concentrated within the conglomerate horizon. There is not even dispersion of gold into the underlying rocks, which is the foot wall or the overlying rock, and you can see the differences in gray. You will notice that the foot wall lithology contains almost in a PPB scale type of gold, where else the reef horizon or the all body horizon contains a lot of gold in, in a grand pattern scale. The other thing that we tend to see is that everywhere, wherever there is this gold, there is these typically sedimentary structures, these lower placer contacts and upper placer contacts. And this is where we tend to find much of the gold distributed. You'll hear people who are working in the vet space and speaking of bottom loaded or top loaded. They're actually speaking of these lower placer contacts and upper placer contacts because that's where the ore grade is concentrated. So if we're to look into this and by just looking at the mineralogical distribution, if I don't tell you that we're dealing with two different things, you won't even notice because the mineralogy of the carbon leader and the mineralogy of the erosion channel is exactly the same. And it's also similar to the blade four formation uh, quartzites, which we find as the foot wall of the carbon leader. So this tends to show us that large scale erosion was actually operating we can see it on a larger scale as preserving the erosion channel, but we can also see it on a very localized scale where we see minor scale uh, uh, erosion within the carbon leader reef and within any other reef in the vet space. The other thing that we have also noticed is that there is an unusual occurrence of carbonate minerals, and these carbonate minerals tend to occur in distinct places, and much of them are also well preserved within the erosion channel. So the scale that I'm showing you in here is just showing the assemblage of things that we have found in other vets type of reefs and what we have also found in the erosion channel. So with this, it gives us more confidence now to look into existing data as part of my concluding slides to look into existing data and try to reconstruct the sequence of events, taking into consideration what other people have found and what we have noticed. And with this, we have noticed that there is a lot of primary minerals and these primary minerals occur in a form of quads, 
tables that many people have seen. We also find a lot of kerogen. Uh, I named it hydrocarbons here, but it's actually kerogen, much, much of it. And we also found different, we find different forms of gold. So we, we do find a lot of pteroidal shaped type of gold. We also find a lot of irregular gold and a lot of native gold that is well preserved. And pyrite also okay in all different forms. But in addition to that, we found that any other mineral that have been used to defend the introduction of gold actually came far much later. So we have a lot of platinoids in the vets, but much of them represent a typical hydrothermal activity. And we also have things such as chalcopyrite, pyrotite, bonite, rutile, pentlandite, among others, that are more of post-depositional or represent post-depositional overprint. And then we also have minerals that re represent key low-grade metamorphism, which we tend to find. And then lastly, what we tend to find is a lot of these calcitic veins. So calcite tend to occur a lot as veins and a lot of quartz veins that are, typical, are typically associated also with euhedral pyrite, which many people have interpreted to be coming from um, a, 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 a more of a hydrothermal or post-depositional alteration of, of different forms. And what you can see, because I have put the carbon leader mineralogy in black bars, and the erosion channel in pink bars, you will notice that there is so much similarities that to dispute the fact that erosion played a major role into this, we, we, we can't explain this with any other model. And with this, we did just a simple mass balance. And with this mass balance, we looked at how much gold actually can, uh, can, 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 can result in the formation of the gold that we find in the erosion channel. So we said, let's start now by looking at the immediate sources so we can look at the erosion channel and we can take the lowest grade of it at 23 grams per ton and a typical thickness of about 0 0.3 meters. This is where we are even away from the kerogen seams or the carbon seams. And with these, we can actually without uh, looking for any alternative sources, mobilize the gold content that we tend to find in this erosion channel by looking at the surrounding ore bodies. So we notice that much of the gold from the erosion channel can be explained by simply sourcing much of the gold coming from the older reefs, such as the carbon leader reef. And with this, this have actually have wide implications because this now also gives us more strong evidence that much of the reefs that are stacked in the vet basin and anywhere in the world may have been a product of recycling of the older uh, carbon bearing material that contains most of the gold. And over time, the reason we no longer have this type of deposits forming, it means we have recycled enough material, uh, enough gold to a point that at a certain stage, the climatic condition and the amount of gold that was available was no longer sufficient to keep on forming the vet type or deposits. Uh, you may ask yourself also how realistic is this process if we speak of erosion and the formation of gold itself coming from background concentration because background concentration is usually between 1.5 parts per billion although in the cup file craton we did find background concentration above 7 ppb which is even far much higher so this slide actually simplifies the process to say that if we look on a global scale and we can also look in the capital craton where the vets basin is coming from, we only need the background concentration of about one ppb of meteorite uh, that is concentrated in 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 in, in rainwater or meteoric meteoric water that is now in more of a uh, river water. And the amount of water that we need is almost about 10 to the power four tons of water that is required. The catchment area can be something like 10 to the power five and the Kafal Creton provide this type of a setup because of its sheer size and its geological setting. So if we're just to give it about only 1000 years, we don't need so many years and we are circulating 10 to the power four tons of water. So if only a very tiny proportion, 0.1 portion of the dissolved gold is bound in the microprobes. It means within one million year, we actually have all the gold that we require to form the vet spacing. And what remains now is more of redistribution of the gold, not only within the vet spacing, but also elsewhere. 
And then with this, I just want to conclude. I could talk more, but we'll take more of the discussions um, uh, during the discussion session itself. What you are looking at here is actually two th thin sections to summarize my, uh, two diagrams to summarize my discussions uh, uh, taken from uh, Fremel 2018, but the conclusions are coming from our paper that, that we have done combined with other forms of evidence. What you can look at here, you will notice that there is a lot of oxygen oscillation that is happening around 3 billion years, showing that much of the gold that was precipitating at the time, there was something that was facilitating the, pre the precipitation. The other thing that you can also see from this diagram, as much as many people will still want to believe that orogenic gold sources play the major role, the peak in orogenic gold is only around 2.7 billion years, whereas the peak in gold in the Vets Basin is far much older. And if you look at the proportion of the juvenile class that, were, class that was forming around that time, it actually speaks to the activities that were happening at the time. So to summarize this, let's look at the structure. There's a lot of structural differences in the Vets Basin. We have all forms of structures that you can imagine from folds to faults to thrust, to all low angle and steep dipping falls and dikes of different forms. And none of them tend to be associated with much of the gold because much of the gold, including the pay shoots where people are mining, they have actually been mapped representing some sort of a, 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 a timing or a coincidence between places where we have paleo channels and places where we have the highest concentration of gold. So there's clear evidence that much of the gold grade that we find in the vets is controlled by sedimentary processes and has to has nothing to do with the structures. The other thing that we have noticed is that there's a lot of alteration in the vets. If you are interested in studying any form of alteration, but major zones of these alterations are only gold bearing where they come across gold bearing horizon. So we don't find a lot of gold anywhere else. And then lastly, uh, you will notice from the mineralogy, from uh, the seismic, uh, to the section that I have showed you, and also from the gold concentration that much of the gold that we have is a product of recycling of existing Asian gold. And this proves to us that much of the gold in the vet 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 run was concentrated by uh, syn genetic processes, followed by a lot of mechanical recycling coupled with localized uh, mobilization within the ore horizon. And with this, I would like to thank everyone. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. That was an amazing talk. Uh, I learned a lot about the Vince Basin and the, the gold there. Um, now I go to Hallelujah to start the discussion. Um, thanks, Aaron. And thanks, Glenn, for that amazing talk you just gave us. Uh, but before I get back to you, Glenn, um, I would like to bring in Fremo because most of his work has actually been referenced by uh, your talk. So I'd just like to call it uh, Fremo to please unmute so he can give us his take on the Vets Basin. He's done so much work and we are lucky to have him here. Fremo, what is your take on the genesis of the Vets Basin and what comments do you have on the erosion or channels that Glenn just commented on? Well, Hello to everybody and uh, hi to Glenn. Thanks for a great talk. Um, to answer your question, hallelujah, I, I don't think I need to give my personal uh, biased view on the wits uh, here because this has been told by Glenn. Um, and indeed, uh, Glenn, you used uh, a lot of my slides from previous talks and uh, effectively the same conclusions that uh, I presented previously, or we presented together in the recent publication. Um, so there's nothing I would like to add here to the basic conclusions. Yes, I 100% agree with what Glenn presented here today in a great way. Um, nevertheless, I would think that in all fairness to the big debate and for the younger uh, uh, participants here, who might not be too familiar with the Witwatersrand uh, uh, gold field history and, and all the discussion about the methodology <laughs> of the gold there. Uh, bear in mind that this whole issue of how did the by far largest concentration of gold in the Earth's crust come about. This debate has been ongoing for decades and has been a very intense debate with very different schools of thoughts. And I don't think that we've really reached the end of that debate. 
Um, as Glenn pointed out uh, in the last, uh, well, probably something like 30 years, uh, it was essentially a debate with uh, in a debate of syngenetic versus epigenetic origin. And we got um, the syngenetic story told by Glenn here today. Um, and Glenn, you focused on the carbon leader reef. Um, the carbon leader was always a very special case uh, in this big debate because a lot of models that have been proposed by various workers uh, were based on the carbon leader, both for and against syngenetic or epigenetic models. Um, the carbon leader is, of course, a special case because, as the name suggests, you have these huge amounts of uh, carbon seams. Unfortunately, much of this is not accessible anymore because most of it has been mined out in the meantime, and we, are, we have to rely on observations from the past. And there's one observation I would like to point out, because maybe that's something that uh, Glenn didn't emphasize too much, uh, largely probably because the fact that you haven't seen the best outcrops because they have, that they are gone. But in the, I remember from the late 80s, early 90s, and I'm very happy to see Lawrence Rob here amongst us, so maybe he can uh, uh, add to this. Uh, I remember observations in the same place that you studied uh, at Trefontaine um, with clasts of mineralized carbon seams in the erosion channel. And that's, of course, a very, very critical observation, because if you have a clast of mineralized carbon as a part of the eroded material, then that would clearly speak against any kind of post-depositional input of the gold into the whole mineralizing system. Um, so that's just an additional observation I would like to add here, uh, because I think it's an important one. But for the discussion um, here now, I would actually like to ask Glenn, uh, if you don't mind, seeing that we have probably quite a number of people here who are not personally familiar with the Bitwaters rent. Mm -hmm. um, could you play devil's advocate and just pretend for five minutes that you're a hydrothermalist and present mm -hmm. the key arguments that you would bring forward as a hydrothermalist for an epigenetic model. Thank you. And, and, and just to mention one thing, I, I, I do have specimen of this mineralized carbon, uh, one of them, which was handed over to me by one of, of the older geologists in the basins. So I have seen what you have just mentioned. Um, and I think there is still one of these rocks in the Oberholzer courtyard in Carltonville coming from the erosion channel that Hans Brauer has collected over the years. So coming to the devil's advocate, uh, the first one that I will mention is that we can form these sulfide minerals that we have in, in, in the vets basin, such as pyrite, by actually sulfidization processes. So we actually don't need a special process to, 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 to have the combination of pyrite and gold in the vets basin. The second one is that much of the carbon that we're speaking about may be coming from the underlying shale if we are disputing that they are more indigenous to, to the vets basin. And I would like to find out from you what you say on the opinion that maybe the carbon that we are calling kerogen seams are actually migrating hydrocarbons coming from below as some of the workers have actually pointed out and the fact that the golden pyrite association, this can be explained by sulfidization reaction. Let's start there. Well, uh, as far as the carbon story is concerned, um, you know my opinion, you presented my opinion on, on the various slides. Um, I'm of the strong belief that we have two different forms of hydrocarbons present, two different textual forms, and uh, that has, that's something that has confused a lot of people for many, many years. Um, the one are the so-called carbon seams, and the other ones are the, well, what, what the miners usually refer to as the flyspeck carbon, little hydrocarbon nodules um, that are 
dispersed throughout various rock types. We find them in the conglomerates. We find them uh, in cross-cutting veins where they can form globules of, uh, well, I've seen these things up to more than a centimeter in size. Uh, that's solidified oil. Eh? That's, there's, there's no doubt about this. Uh, so that's what we would call pyrobitumen. And um, if you look at the textures that you have shown in the one slide, uh, you borrowed from me uh, the thin section with the, with the keratin on it, or what you, what you refer to as keratin, uh, these rounded forms could look like pyrobitumen nodules that are just tectonically squeezed a little bit. Um, yeah, it was a bit early on here. No, here, there, that's the slide. Here on the bottom left of this slide, uh, these sort of ellipsoidal forms, they could be interpreted indeed as uh, tectonically squeezed, um, originally rounded uh, bitumen nodules. And as I said, we have evidence of these bitumen nodules, nodules in many places. So at the first glance, um, one cannot, uh, you know, one can't be surprised if people interpreted these kind of features as pyrobitumen as well. And if that is pyrobitumen um, in our carbon seam, so to speak, then of course the gold in it would be hydrothermal. And then we have a hydrothermal model for, the, for basically most of the gold in the Witwatersrand Basin. Uh, if, if we agree that this is the source of the detrital gold as you uh, established for the erosion channel. Um, so the critical question really is, is the picture we see here, especially the one on the bottom left, is this, migrated oil that is solidified, or is this an in situ uh, microbial mat? That's the fundamental question. And yes, in our study, when we looked at the, at the organic chemistry, the, you presented it all in your talk, so I don't need to repeat this here, but indeed, um, I would say the top right diagram on this slide, that's the critical one, the lack of carbon isotope fractionation between the alkanes because um, such fractionation is a characteristic feature of oils. At least that's something we know from modern oils. And um, a bitumen that we analyzed um, is also plotted on the same diagram. And you see a strong fractionation uh, between the uh, alkanes with different carbon numbers, uh, which is exactly what we would expect for migrated oil. But we don't see this in uh, the carbon seams. So that's the geochemical argument for the carbon seams to represent in situ uh, microbial mats. There is, of course, also a purely textual evidence, and that is the slide on the left, uh, top left, um, a beautiful hand specimen. But I mean, this is just one of many, many, many examples that we found um, very delicate structures um, that illustrate that the um, hydrocarbons occupy positions in the rock that can only be explained by sedimentary processes and not by tectonic processes. Now, my question here is to everybody who looks at this slide on the top left, how would you interpret these funny crinkles? Um, well, we don't have the time now to discuss with uh, 50 people uh, what, you, what you interpret into this slide. I tell you, uh, these are desiccation cracks. And it's actually the desiccation cracks that are filled with the carbon. Now that's a kind of structure that is so well preserved, the sedimentary structure so well preserved, very, very difficult to explain by post sedimentary influx of oils through some kind of tectonic structure. That's not what we see. So I think we do have evidence that speaks for the syngeneity of the hydrocarbon seams. That's critical. But actually I would like now to give, my, to give the, the word to Lawrence Robb because he might disagree here and we should, uh, we should discuss this here very openly. So there are other opinions as well. It's not only my opinion. Thanks, Hartwick. Um, I will come in um, at this point because um, I think there are, there are a few issues. Can you hear everyone? Can you hear me okay there, hallelujah? Yes, we can Good. hear you, Lawrence. You okay, well, yeah, I mean, let's just keep that diagram that's on the screen, um, the diagram of Glenn's. Um, I think that, um, you know, as, as Hardwick's pointed out, you know, there is some fairly compelling textual evidence to suggest that, um, the, that the bitumens, the hydrocarbons, whatever you want to call them, are syngenetic. I think um, there almost certainly was, um, there almost certainly were um, algal rich layers um, 
they were being deposited at, at the same time as the conglomerates um, and at the same time that detrital gold was being washed and eroded into the basin. Um, I think my view is that textually the, and the, that volumetrically there's really little of that primary carbon left behind. And I would argue that the majority of the hydrocarbons are actually remobilized. Um, we see them in a variety of other textual um, forms besides the ones that Glenn has shown. I think that, that um, the set of images there is very selective. I think there's a lot of evidence that indicates that the hydrocarbons have been remobilized. You see, for example, hydrocarbons um, bifurcating around quartz pebbles. You see them um, occurring as little veinlets um, throughout the, the sediments. You even find hydrocarbons in quartz veins cutting through the conglomerates, and you find hydrocarbons in the basement granites beneath the Witwatersrand Round Basin, which that's been shown by Joel Drennan and Patrick Lande and several other people. The other interesting thing about the hydrocarbons is that they chemically, um, and I guess biochemically, they're not homogeneous, which is perhaps what's being suggested there in the in Glenn's diagram. They're actually very heterogeneous, not only in terms of, well, they may be fairly homogeneous in terms of their carbon isotope characteristics, but in terms of their spectral characteristics and compositional characteristics, they're extremely heterogeneous. And that heterogeneity um, in the structure and the form of the hydrocarbons is a function of the proximity of the hydrocarbon to uranium, for example, uraninite. So you get, for example, the hydrocarbons being very much more, um, uh, I guess, uh, simple as you approach the, 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 the radiogenic halo around an individual uraninite grain. Um, so the, these hydrocarbons are certainly not um, a homogeneous phenomenon. Texturally and chemically, they're very diverse. And where I, I, I do believe that the hydrocarbons themselves were probably originated in the Witz Basin, not in the Transvaal Basin, as some people have previously suggested, but, but they have been significantly remobilized, as you would expect any um, hydrocarbon to have done so in any maturing sedimentary basin. So you have essentially organic material which gets remobilized and matures as the sediment is deposited and as it's obviously as it's buried and, and progressively metamorphosed. And that progression is what we see in the Witz hydrocarbons as well. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly more complicated and more heterogeneous picture than I think has been presented um, here this morning. The, the other point that I was gonna make earlier um, before this was that, um, that you know, one, of the, one of the amazing things about the Witz Basin, which has always intrigued me, um, is that it, it looks so ordinary when you, um, when you look at it in terms of the, the sedimentary process, the composition, the, the, the setting, um, you know, the, the foreland basin setting. There's nothing hugely unusual about the Witz Basin other than this phenomenal endowment of gold. Um, and it doesn't matter how you look at it. In, in my view, there's no other, there's, there's something about the Witz Basin which we still fundamentally do not understand. I think part of it has to do with the hydrocarbon story because I can't but help feel that somehow the, this endowment of gold has got something to do with the hydrocarbons. But it also ultimately has, has, some, has got something to do with what was going on in the source area, in the hinterland. Uh, somewhere between 2.9 and 2.7 billion years ago in the Kapwal Kraton, there was something that we still do not quite um, understand that allowed this phenomenal endowment of gold to occur in the Witz Basin and not in any other basin anywhere else on this planet. And you know, if you look at the endowment figure that Glenn showed right at the beginning, you'll, you have to be struck by the enormous disparity in the amount of gold that's in the Witz Basin compared to the amount of gold that's in, in the Tarquayan or in the Huronian um, or in Brazil. It, um, it's just not the same. And so there is something about what was going on in the Witz hinterland that is absolutely unique. In, in my view anyway. Um, but anyway, maybe that's enough for me. I think I'm sure there are lots of other people who've got other things to say as well. Um, thanks, Lawrence, for that contribution. And I'm seeing that Radwig is unmuted, so maybe he has a comment to make. So I'm gonna give him the chance to unmute before we take the questions from the, the, the audience. 
sorry. I mean, uh, this is uh, not my not my field of expertise. I have, uh, I guess, some questions about the the remobility, and I wondered maybe for somebody uh, from a little bit different background on the hydrothermal side, uh, is can Glenn maybe you can talk about the the sulfur isotopes of the pyrite, and 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 maybe this doesn't matter. Maybe it's all. Um, uh, maybe it's all bacteria sulfate reduction, or maybe there was just no sulfate in the in the system at all because of the um, system. But can you learn anything from the sulfur isotopes in terms of the source for at least for the sulfur in the pyrite? Oh yes. So a study that was done. Uh, I I also did recently did some sulfur isotopes on this, but. Um, so I'm going to go back to this study. So a study that, that was done by Bradley Guy at University of Johannesburg mainly focused on the pyrites and the sulfur isotopes. And he actually collected a number of samples in a number of different uh, types of environments, starting from the Western Basin going into the Central Rand Basin. And the conclusions that he came up with was mainly dealing with the pyrites or the origin of pyrites. And he emphasized the fact that much of these pyrites, of course, are detrital and the source of sulfur itself, there is a, long, uh, there is a lot of uh, sedimentary input into it. But of course, there is a lot of variation because a follow-up study that was also doing sulfur isotopes in 2009 by Sharad Master and Axel Hoffman actually looked again on, on the sulfur and, and iron isotopes, but all of them came to similar type of conclusions, although the studies were done in independent study areas. One was mainly looking at much of the vets and younger reefs. And what they have noticed was that the signatures for the pyrite in different localities of the basins, especially those that are interpreted as detrital and syngenetic, tend to have more of similar isotopic composition and the source of sulfur also tend to be quite similar with a lot of localized variation in terms of where it may be coming from. But that's, that's most of the work that was done because in addition to that, the same group have looked into the amount of gold that we find in this pyrite uh, versus the composition of sulfur isotopes. And they found that certain pyrite types, especially concretionary ones, or the ones that has inclusions, also contain excessive amount of metals, not just gold, but things such as nickel, as compared to younger pyrites, which are showing slightly different sulfur sources, the hydrothermal ones. Oh, that's cool. That's really, uh, that's really interesting, kind of when thinking about the multiple generations of pyrite that you talked about earlier. Um, was there a are there other comments from the panelists before we this before we uh, move towards audience questions? Uh, if you want, I would be happy to add something to what Lawrence uh, Rob uh, mentioned uh, because I think he pointed out a few very important aspects here. Um, the one that the story is far more complex uh, simply due to the fact that these rocks have seen. Uh, more than once various alteration events, post positional alteration events that uh, obviously mobilized uh, components, not only hydrocarbons, but almost everything else, including the gold. But of course, the big question is, from an exploration point of view, from an economic geology point of view, what's the, what's the economic significance of all of this mobilization? Um, so yes, of course, uh, we can explain much of the gold, uh, some of the uranium minerals, much of the hydrocarbons by mobilization, hydrothermal mobilization. But the question is always, where did it come from? What actually got mobilized? Is it a short range mobilization or is it a long range mobilization? And I think what Glenn presented today was a lot of evidence that would speak for short range mobilization, in which case the mobilization becomes from an economic point of view, not terribly important. It's of great academic interest, but uh, for the miners, well, they know what they have to look for in order to find the gold. Um, now, the big issue, and of course, that's probably the most exciting question about this whole WITS uh, story. 
why is there so much gold in the Wits and so little gold in other Achaean conglomerates as we know as, um, today? And um, I think there is one aspect that should also be taken into consideration, and that is the aspect of preservation. The fact that we still see something like a carbon leader reef with in situ microbial mats, that's, that's so sensational that this is still preserved. Of course, this is, these are exotic things. These are just remnants uh, of a much, much bigger system that probably operated on all Achaean cratons, I would imagine. Um, but the fact that we have one place where these things are still preserved, that's the amazing thing. And that's luckily um, the, the, these remnants of these old microbial mats. They help us to possibly unravel the story. Otherwise, we would be completely clueless. Um, so in a sense, I think or my take on this is that the reason why the Wits is so exceptionally well endowed is not that this gold mineralizing system didn't operate on other cratons. I think that was probably a common feature on all Achaean cratons, but it's only preserved in the Carpal Craton. And that, of course, raises the follow-up question, why? Why is it only preserved in the Carpal Craton and not somewhere else? Um, and bear in mind, what's the tectonic position of the Witwatersund Basin? It's right, bang in the middle of pretty much probably the most buoyant craton that we know of. It hasn't been affected by any orogenic activity for at least the last 2 billion years. And even uh, since 2.8 billion years, it hasn't affected in a serious way. So it's surely the best preserved Mesoarchaean sediment succession that we know of anywhere in the world. So it's this preservation in a in the middle of a relatively stable craton, that's one issue. But then there's another issue. It's also preserved thanks to the coincidence of having been covered by the right rocks. And what are these right rocks? Uh, you can all see here on the map this red dot right in the middle of the Witwatersund Basin. That's the Friede Foot Dome. That's a huge impact structure, as you probably know. And it's the impact melt sheet that was generated two billion years ago that covered the entire Bidwatersrand Basin. And that was, of course, a perfect seal that prevented these rocks from being eroded. Uh, much, much earlier, effectively immediately after the sedimentation finished in the Bidwatersrand Basin, we had the extrusion of huge amounts of flat basalt uh, and the Ventostorp um, <coughs> supergroup the Clip-Reviersberg Clip uh, group basalts. Flat basalts, everybody who has worked with flat basalts knows these are very, very competent rocks. So the ceiling and a huge amount of flat basalts, and a few mm. hundred billion years later, again, and a, a very, very competent impact melt sheet. That was probably one of the reasons why these Witwatersrand rocks are so well preserved in the middle of this old craton. And that makes the Witwoltes run unique. So I think it's not a unique mineralization process. I think it's the uniqueness of its preservation. Yeah, it is. Um, it's very interesting to note. Just, I, I agree with uh, what Hartwig has said. I think on the two counts, I think the remobilization was definitely fairly local. I don't think we're looking at huge hydrothermal systems that had a craton wide impact at all. Oh, and secondly, of course, the basin is extremely well preserved. It is interesting in that regard that um, probably the closest neighbor to the Carpal Craton, of course, that people have often referred to is the Pilbara Craton in the northern part of Western Australia, um, which has got remarkably similar geology to many aspects of the uh, Carpal, with the one exception that, that they don't have a Witz Basin yet. So just recently, in, and uh, recently, uh, the last few years, um, there have been indications of Bidwatersrand like sedimentary basins beneath younger cover in the Pilbara and, and in between the Pilbara and the, and, and the um, Yilgarn cratons in Western Australia. So um, I think the Australians are hoping, like hell, that this isn't that unique, that, that maybe they've got their own version um, in Western Australia. But other than that, there's no doubt that it is um, 
it is a pretty damn unique set of events that we're looking at. Um, well, thanks, uh, Lorenz. Thanks, Hadwig, for your input. And we are lucky to have two of the experts that have worked on the Red Basin, uh, in addition to Glenn. So if you are attending this talk, consider yourself very lucky, because it's not so many times that we get to have experts sitting in the same room talking about the same topic. So with that said, we'll, we will be taking the questions from the audience. And uh, Aaron, do you have our first question? Yeah, absolutely. So just so everyone's aware, this little session has gone already a long time ago. So I just want to make sure that Glenn is OK uh, to continue with the question session. Uh, but yes, that's OK. Yes, I, I am. We can continue. I have, I have sufficient time today. Great. Then we'll, add, we'll ask, uh, we at least have a time for questions, uh, for a few questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, we have a question from Henri Sangui uh, Sanguinetti. He asks if the uh, paleo channel and the carbon metal model, sorry, carbon models are also sustained by the link between uranium and gold in the basin, or how the link exists between the paleo channel and the, and the carbon leader model. Sorry, the carbon model. I'm not sure exactly exactly what he wants. Uh I'm not really sure specifically, but what I can mention is where we find these kerogen seams, it's not the same place where we find the conglomerates. So the kerogen seams, if I was to show you with these diagrams, the forms of environment where we find them, they represent typically fairly quiet environments, not very harsh to allow their preservation. So where we find them, for an example, in this diagram in here, we have a different form of a system as compared to a typical fluvial system that deposited conglomerates on the side. So their stability and their preservation also does not only owe it to further covering by younger sediments, but also the fact that their depositional environment or places where we found them are not represented by major paleo channels where we find um, thick conglomerates of more than a meter sometimes, because these carbon seams are mainly in a millimeter scale for most of the cases. So you find them around 30 millimeters, and at most you'll find them around one to two millimeters. So they are not as thick as the conglomerates themselves. So when it comes to uraninite itself and gold, within the kerogen seams, you do find that relationship. And uh, one thing that Lawrence have mentioned that we have these multiple forms of carbon, which many people have been studying more recently, be it on an experimental lab simulation or looking for any remnants of, of carbon in quartz veins and, and, and carbon in, 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 in other places that are not uh, the, the conglomerates and, and also not uh, corrigent seams themselves. What people have tend to found was that there is typically more uraninite compared to gold when you are away from the kerogen seams. And a typical example for this is a reef which is far much younger, which is the black reef sitting far much younger above all, all the vets type reefs. It actually contains a lot of uraninite in one particular portion, but that uraninite can be explained because it's sitting on top of another vets type bearing reefs known, known as the, the, the Livingstone reefs, which actually have high content of uraninite. So those carbon nodules or those pyrobutamine nodules that contains uraninite, uh, the uraninite is actually quite highly localized because you, you only find it in high content when there is a reef below the black reef that contains high content of uraninite. And in much of the places you find that there's a disproportion between gold and uraninite away from the, from the kerogen seams. Well, that's really interesting. I, I think, uh, yeah, wouldn't that suggest some sort of, I guess the question for you is the uraninite is generally viewed as detrital or is it uh, something precipitated by um, reduced, the most, the most interesting thing about the mineralogy of the vets is very common. 
is that you find exactly the same minerals everywhere you go. But what you find different is the texture of the minerals. So we do have the trital uraninite, which many people have studied, including um, uh, uh, Lawrence and, and, and Hartwick and their students, including myself. Um, but what you find is that the type of uraninite that we're speaking about is no longer the uraninite that we find more on, on, on a detrital scale that many people have observed. And, and the reason is simple. I mean, uh, uranium is one of the highly mobile um, uh, metals because a simple change in, uh, in, in, in the environment, it simply changed to a uranite iron and all it needs is a place to precipitate. And if there is these hydrocarbons that we do find all over the places, it means there's also quite an easy process of polymerization where we find uraninite with carbon in those particular uh, processes. So there are clear distinctions because of the differences in textures and how it occurs and what form of carbon do we find it? Great, no thanks, that, that clears up uh, a little bit of the uranium and question. Hallelujah, is there another question from the audience? Um, yes, there's a question which uh, Hartwig and Lawrence sort of answered uh, uh, previously. Um, but the question goes, do you think this, is, this process was particular to the Kappa Craton? And the, the follow-up question is, have you been able to do the paleo reconstruction with other cratons like the Congo Craton or the Western African Craton? Glenn, so the, uh, over to you. The first one has been answered by Hartwick and Lawrence. I'll be uh, saying exactly the same thing if I was to say that, because we do find this process that is quite common, but the preservation mechanism is completely different between the Kapfal and other cratons. And we'll see what the Australians come up with, with the different exploration campaigns that they have. On the Paleomag side, my first job was actually working in, a, in, in the first Paleomag lab uh, ran by Nick Bjorx at UJ. And uh, now there is Michiel de Kock who is actually running this and they have done a lot of paleomagnetism modeling, trying to piece up things together, including reviving models of, of, of the Valbara Creton and, 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 and considering that the Kafal Creton and the Pilbara Creton were at some point maybe in contact or one thing. So that work has been done significantly. And more recently, there is also a lot of work that is being done by Ashley Gamsley, again, continuing with the same work that Michiel de Kock is doing. And they are trying to find if there's any link between all forms of Creton that may have been in contact with the Kafal in different stages of time. So that work is being done and is ongoing. Some of them, they do have conclusive evidence, but in some of it, it remains more of a modeling exercise and no conclusive evidence exists. Um, thank, thank you, Glenn. You have it there. Preservation has been one of the key things of the Bits Basin, and we have heard that being repeated by the three panelists. Um, I would like to ask Rajashi to please unmute so we can ask the question. Rajashi, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrongly, but please don't mute and ask your question. No, no, hi, uh, hi, hallelujah. I guess we have met before in Ireland sometime in 2019, I guess. Uh, anyways, uh, hi, Glenn. I had a small question. Uh, uh, since I have been working on a similar kind of a gold occurrence in India, so I was wondering, Glenn, if there is some sort of a correlation between the granite greenstone terrain and the gold endowment, specifically because as I see the kind of uh, paleoarchean granitoid that I am encountering in India, it has a very chondritic, uh, I would say, hafnium isotopes and ND isotope ratio. So basically indicating that it is a direct melt from a, a direct uh, product of a parental mephic melt. But uh, when I see the uh, granitoid uh, greenstone terrain under the uh, carbon leader reef, it has a rather subchondritic ratio, indicating that there have been involvement of older crustal components. So basically indicating a higher degree of differentiation from the parental mafic melt. So do you think the degree of differentiation in the underlying granitoids has a direct control over the amount of gold that could have been incorporated in these conglomerates? Could that have a direct first order control? Uh, not really. Uh, what people have looked at, and especially people like Axel Hoffman, was to look mm -hmm. at seafloor alteration 
that was happening in the mm -hmm. Archean. And, and a perfect case study was done in the Barberton Greenstone Belt, where they found that it's not really the issue of differentiation that is an issue, it's an issue of silicification that kept the mobility of gold in places where we have greenstone gold, such as in the Barberton. And they looked at the case of Komatiats, for an example, which had a classic case of this. And above them, we also have a lot of other uh, igneous components that indicates differentiation. And Lawrence Rob will also assist me on this because I'm sure he, he have worked a lot in the Barberton. But what they have found was that much of the gold mobility at the time was more limited because of silicification, not because of differentiation. Okay, but as I understand from the initial few slides that you presented, that the uh, you said that the entire uh, greenstone, the granite greenstone hinterland is supposed to be the source of gold and not limited to the comatiites or the calcic igneous sources. Maybe. Uh, irrespective of its composition, it was a wholesome source to be so, to be said. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so you, you are correct in that. Uh, there is other people. I When I did my PhD, I focused on shales. But I know that Jan Kramers and, and, and his PhD student back then also looked into granites and other people such as Ian Pitcane also looked at granites all over the world and, and, and other forms of rocks. And they all came to the conclusion that there was something unusual with some of these granitoid greenstone terrains because some of them had exceptionally high background concentration of metals, not just gold. So in the Kapfal Creton, what I have found when I was looking into the shales, which are also a product of weathering uh, for, of the igneous rocks that you're talking about, was that in some of them, we do find excessively high gold contents as compared to others. And this is the reason I'm saying that it's not really a matter of differentiation for most of them, although differentiation, of course, did play a role. But uh, I wouldn't single it as the only process that have controlled the availability of gold that was available for leaching out. Okay, okay, thanks, Glenn. I mean, that's what I was thinking that if we go into the older counterparts, like into the Paleoarchean siliciclastic sequences, so does the older granites have a lower gold endowment compared to the younger granite greenstone terrains? But it's fine, I got the point. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, this has been a great discussion and it has exceeded the expected time. So with that said, I would like to ask the three panelists, Hartwig, Lawrence, and then Glenn, to just give us their final words when it comes to the wet basin. Hartwig, I would like to start with you. <laughs> the final word. Well, I think I, I did that already. Yes, we have established what are the reasons why the wet is unique. We have a unique time window at about 2.9 billion years when uh, um, the evolution of the atmosphere, of the biosphere, of the tectosphere all played together in order to set the right scene for concentrating large amounts of gold, probably on all cratons in the world, but preserved in the amounts as we find them in the bits only in the carpal craton. I think it's the preservation that makes the carpal craton unique. Excellent. Um, Lawrence, over to you. Um, yeah, just one final thing. I think that um, you know, after, what was it, 135 years of <clears throat> mining, um, almost continuous mining, and having produced uh, you know, some significant proportion of uh, global gold output um, in that period, the Ritz Basin, um, it still actually offers fantastic opportunities for research. Um, and I'm not talking just about the pure economic geology type research where you're looking at maybe the distribution of gold or the relationship between sedimentology and, and gold grade and these kind of things, but the more esoteric and for me more fascinating aspects like where did this gold come from? What is it about the setting in the Carbwell Craton that is just so unique? Um, there are still, and, and I think the issue of of uh, the evolution of life and um, what this the what the kerogen or bitumen seams actually represent, and we know that they are certainly organic in origin. But so there are any number of really exciting issues, and and um, 
you know, I think that maybe this could be a stimulus for a, a new round of, of research in, into the Witz Basin, which I'd very much like to see. And it, it doesn't have to be just South African based. I, I think that this is, um, these are research opportunities that have global, global impact. And, um, uh, and I think that if something comes out of this, um, then perhaps, perhaps a, a stimulus for further research into the Witz Basin and into this kind of the setting of, of, of these rocks. Um, would be great to see. Excellent, Lawrence. And uh, at All Deposits Hub, we will be happy to host a symposium just dedica dedicated to the Bits Basin. And with your help, Hartwig, Lawrence, and Glenn would, in, would gladly do that. Maybe we can initiate that conversation on just having the symposium around the Bits Basin. I mean, it's one of a kind who wouldn't want to attend that symposium. With that said, Glenn, your last words. Thank you. So for me, I think the story of gold itself, there have been multiple evidence and uh, there is no better time than now to at least answer some of the questions that many people have had. But I think the future for the basin itself goes beyond just navigating for and, and, and searching for gold. There's a lot of interesting things. Uh, more recently, there is the largest helium gas deposits that have been discovered very close to the Fredefort meteorite impact dome, and the question of it being named one of the only largest helium concentration in one place also brings other questions such as, can the vets in future be one of the primary sources of, of energy? An example, we, when you go to the Welcome Gold Fields, we have methane bleeding in a way that whenever the wind direction changes, there is fire that you can see in some of the underground mines also have a lot of this methane. The other question is the implication, not only from the geology side, but from the subsidence side to say, what are the long-term implications of subsidence that is induced by mining? So this also goes beyond just looking at the rocks themselves. And the last one is what sort of learnings can we apply from here? Because for many years, we have been doing comparison between the vats and any other craton or comparison of the vats between the deposits in India. Uh, can we start now applying some of these models that have been proposed, uh, not preferring one over the other, to see if this can be actioned into an exploration-based model? Because at the moment, much of the academic research and economic research have been focusing on finding the vet space on, on, on the features that we see here, but can we test some of this model as an exploration model in other places? Well, thank you so much, Glenn. It seems like the future for the with water sand basin is actually quite rich uh, with, with researchers such as yourself uh, continuing uh, the exploration and the generation of ideas. So thank you. Uh, Glenn for joining us today and thank you to our panelists and, and all the participants.